So Old Yellow was a children's novel from 1956, and it was written by Fred Gibson, who ended up receiving a Newbery Honour in 1957, and he also wrote a sequel, which was Savage Sam, so this book came out in 1962, and was later turned into a film in 1963 although we probably won't cover it within uh, the course of, of this channel's history because you know, the film was relatively minor. And also we should say that there was another book which came out posthumously and this was called Little Alice. So this is focusing on the younger son. And this came out five years after he died. So this came out in 1978. So Old Yellow was originally based off of a dark colored border collie called Rattler. So unlike Yellow, which in the film is a mongrel mix of a Labrador and a Mastiff, so you can tell that I don't really know much about dogs because I had to read that several times. So yeah. So anyway, so originally it was meant to be a border collie, but in this it's a mongrel breed between a Labrador and a Mastiff. Now the stories were kept largely identical as Fred ended up being the co-writer for the script for this, along with William Turnberg. So William Turnberg, his brother, was the one who wrote Ben Hur's uh, screenplay. So you know he's the less famous uh, brother writer, but still. So as a result of Fred Gibson being a co-writer, this is essentially why the story of the story is essentially the same, whether you look at the book or whether you look at the film. So that covers the story of the story. And now in terms of the story of the studio. So in terms of the story of the studio, I highly recommend that you watch The Making of Walt Disney's Old Yeller, 1957, which is narrated by Fess Parker. So more on him a little bit later. So within that, it explains that Walt Disney was very much influenced when he was growing up because in Missouri, where he was from, uh, you ended up having uh, some Civil War vets, right? So some of them were Union troops, and some of them were, were Confederate. And so as a result of this, he was very much influenced by this and also with stories of the West. So within the living lifetime of Walt Disney when he was growing up, there were, you know, the, the memories of the Civil War and of like the American West were still very present in people's minds. And so he wanted to make stories which touched on both of these major themes. So you can see this already with the Song of the South and you can see this with many other uh, stories as well. So this is part of the reason why it's based in late 1860s Texas because it's still in the aftermath of the Civil War and it's still very much tied up with the frontier myth. So more on that a little bit later when we talk about the themes in the history. But in terms of the casting now, uh, we should say that most of the actors who were in this were people who tended to be in many of Disney's TV shows. So during the 1950s, he kind of focused more on making short uh, things for TV. But also some of these actors were also in some minor films. So first of all, we have to talk about Fess Parker, who we just mentioned. Uh, so Fess Parker, uh, he was most famous for playing David Crockett in the TV series of that time. But within this, he plays Jim Coates, who is, of course, the dad. Next, we have to talk about Tommy Kirk. So he is Travis in this, and he also appeared in The Shaggy Dog, and later would appear in the sequel of Old Yellow, which, of course, as we've mentioned, is Savage Sam. So this came out in 1963. However, I should say this, this is very important. Tommy ended up being fired by Disney in 1963 because it was discovered that he was gay. So in this time, obviously, you know, it was illegal in most places in America uh, to be homosexual. And basically, Tommy, as a 21 year old at this point, he ended up being, you know, outed, uh, let's put it this way. Um, so Disney ended up firing him and he ended up actually rehiring him only because there was a certain film that he was in, which was The Misadventures of Merlin Jones, which came out in 1963. So this film here ended up becoming a hit. And so as a result of that, that's why he, you know, for a short time, rehired him. It was actually a very, very dark story. And actually, if you watch the film again, knowing that Travis is, you know, the actor that plays Travis is gay, it gives you a very different perspective. But we'll talk more on that a little bit later when we talk about the themes in the history. So moving on now to the next actor, and this is the person who plays Arliss. And this is Kevin Kakarin, who we mentioned in the previous video. So he was just in some minor films other than this. And he also ended up later in life becoming a TV producer and a TV director. Next, you have the mum, who is, of course, Katie. And this was played by Dorothy Maguire. So she ended up being in A Gentleman's Agreement from 1947. And with also the mum in The Swiss Family Robinson, which we're going to cover within the next video. So more on that a bit later. 
Next, you have Jeff York, and he is the person who plays Bud. And he was just a minor actor who actually appeared in some quite major films, so we have this on screen at the moment. Next, you end up having Beverly Washburn, and she is the person who plays Elizabeth. And uh, she was just a minor actor who was in quite minor films other than this. And then finally, in terms of humans, you have Chuck Connors, and he plays uh, Bern Anderson. And so he actually, within his career, was a writer, a basketball player, a baseball player, and was also a minor actor, most notably a TV actor, especially in the TV show The Rifleman, where he was the star. And then finally, of course, we have to talk about Spike the dog. So Spike, he's the one who plays Old Yeller, and actually he appeared in many other films as well. So originally, uh, Spike was actually meant to be uh, put down, but actually he ended up being a rescued dog, and therefore, you know, even in his very short life, he ended up uh, appearing in many, many different things. And I think his legacy, you know, it really touches the hearts of many, many people and will do for many centuries to come. So that covers the story of the studio. But now we have to talk about the themes and the history within this. And actually, of the many different themes, the most notable, I would have to say, is that of the American West. So the American West is obviously something which is ever present in the minds of many American people, both in those times and also even to this day to a limited extent. And especially for people living in the 1950s, you know, you had many, many different Western films which came out around that time. And this is because we're in living memory. Many people still would have remembered what it would have been like fighting Indians and basically uh, you know, being out on the frontier. And so at the time when this is set, it's still, you know, they've obviously settled, but they still remember what it's like to have in Indians. And this is why, for instance, Arliss is running about with a Native American ahead here, yeah, because, of course, this is the time that it was. Also, as well, we have to talk about the fact that it's the post-Civil War world. So, of course, Texas, like many other places within the South, was highly devastated as a result of the Civil War. And especially because the currency which they had was essentially worthless because of hyperinflation and also the fact that there was no confederate government to back these things up. And this is actually said right at the very beginning of the film when Alice and Travis are talking, but of course they're two young boys, they wouldn't really understand anything to do with what the confederacy was even. And also this is part of the reason why Jim, their dad, has to go on these cattle drives as well as all the other men. And actually, if you look at the uh, John Wayne film from 1948, which is Red River, highly recommend that you watch it. It's an absolute classic. We haven't seen it before. But again, this basically looks at the same sort of thing. So essentially, this film is almost the same story of Red River, but just told from the perspective of the women and children who stay behind, as opposed to the men who go out on the drive. And again, this is something which is really noticeable within this, which is that I think the major theme is that of gender. So if you have a drinking game for every single time that they mention the word man or men or woman in this, right, or something along those lines, you will be all over the place, right? Because this film is very typical of the film from the 1950s, where it's the reinforcement of gender norms, right? So, you know, the men, they go out to, to work, they have to go on the cattle drives, the women and children have to stay behind. And actually, there's many different lines in this year, which it's reinforced again and again. So, for instance, Bud has been asked to stay behind to protect the women folk. You also have a burn, and he talks you know, explicitly about a woman cooked meal, you know, as opposed to a man cooked meal, which was a bit, you know, it's not as good as a woman cooked meal is going to be. And also, Jim says to the boys, take care of your mother in front of her. So it's not even like, you know, she's a full grown adult, they're little children. And yet he is saying that because you guys are boys, it's your job to protect your mother, as opposed to the other way around, where the mother is the one protecting the boys, right? So these kind of themes of like how strongly these uh, 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 gender norms are being kind of reinforced, I think it really would have had an impact on uh, Tommy Kirk. And actually, if you watch the film again, knowing that you know he's actually gay, it has a very different perspective on this because you can see that you know, Tommy Kirk ended up really struggling with his sexuality and really struggling with, um, you know, what it meant to be a man in those days, uh, especially where these gender norms are so strongly being reinforced. And actually, this part of the reason why he ended up becoming an addict, he ended up becoming, you know, had all sorts of mental health issues, yeah, as a result of this. 
where this kind of almost toxic masculinity, uh, I hate to use that term, but it's almost being like reinforced at like a really hyper level. So again, I really highly recommend that you watch the film again with that in mind and then kind of see what, you know, what it's like. Uh, yeah, it's all good, like kind of like men and women having kind of traditional roles, but where there's an exception to that, that has some, you know, that's something which has to be borne in mind. So what if Disney himself was not that progressive on that issue of LGBT, you know, in stark contrast to how it is nowadays with Disney, what he was well ahead of his time with is, as we said with regard to Dumbo, as we said with regard to Bambi, he was well ahead of his time in terms of animal welfare. So we'll talk about this in a bit more detail when we talk about the uh, notable lines and notable effects. But it should be noted that, like I said, there's no animals that were harmed in the making of this. And the reason is because, you know, the, the animals, they were actually friends with each other, right? So these were uh, stage uh, animals and they were basically trained by their trainers to act in a certain way to be, you know, while they're on camera. And actually it's a thing where one of the representatives from the American Humane Association was there throughout the entire filming of this to make sure that none of the animals were injured during the making of this film. So that's actually something which again is very progressive. I don't think at the time films necessarily had to adhere to those standards, but most likely they're not. I think that Walt Disney would have done this on the insistence that if you're going to have animals, and actually some of these, you know, some of the animal fights in this look really spectacular on camera, but it's all done humanely and it's all, you know, it's all done properly. So that's something to really note. And actually this ties in with the legacy of the film. 